Good morning. I'd like to call the June 2022 ad hoc committee meeting to order. Will the recording secretary please call roll? Makita Bino Shire. Present. Bonnie Kla. Present. David Simmons. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. The item before us today is the interview and recommendation of a member to the school board member position for the committee of credentials. As a result of a last minute application withdrawal, the ad hoc committee will be interviewing only one candidate for the school board member position on the committee of credentials. There is one vacancy for the school board member. The interview will be conducted in person. At the conclusion of the interview, <clears throat> the ad hoc committee may recommend the applicant to the commission for appointment of, of school board member on the committee of credentials. The commission will take final action on Friday, June 17th. We will now open for public comment on this item. Members of the public who are attending the meeting at the commission office will need to submit a request to address the commission card to the meeting moderator. Individuals who join the meeting via teleconference, please notify the meeting moderator by clicking on the raise hand icon if participating through Zoom or pressing star nine if participating by phone. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? <clears throat> there are no public comments on this. Thank item. you. The public comment period for this item is now closed. The only candidate for the school board member position on the committee of credentials is Michelle Peralt. Peralt. Hello, Ms. Peralt. Thank you for joining us at the Commission on Teacher Credentialing and for speaking with us today. We're gonna to ask you a few questions and at the end of the interview, you will have an opportunity to ask us any questions you may have. Welcome to the commission. Thank you for having me. Of course. We have several questions for you. So I'll go ahead and start. When does your term expire on the school board? So I am in the middle of a term. My term will expire at the end of 2024. So I have two years remaining on my term. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the committee of credentials meets three full days per month and is required to prepare for the meeting by reviewing all cases in advance. The committee reviews educator misconduct cases to determine whether to recommend discipline on the educator's license. Do you believe you can make this time commitment and review this subject matter? I do. Um, I do currently work full time. However, prior to submitting um, the application for consideration, I've spoken with my I work for a, a local school board. I mean, I'm honest work for a local school district. Um, and I spoke with my superintendent to just make sure that this was something that could be accommodated. Uh, in fact, uh, he not only uh, said not a problem, but uh, is a strong supporter of having all of his staff volunteer, particularly in the education area. So it should not be a problem. Mm -hmm. Please tell us why you're interested in serving on the Committee of Credentials. Sure. So. Um, Obviously, I have some past history with the commission, um, and uh, I think w even when I was here, there was a lot of conversation. I was a school board member then, um, and there was the talk about, you know, gosh, it would be really nice to be able to contribute in this way. Obviously, I couldn't at the time, but, uh, you know, I really, I think it's important, particularly now, that, um, that we have a process that allows for um, review of an individual um, if there's an issue that, that this is the process that we have in place to help um, mitigate that. And I think, I mean, ultimately, you know, my, my entire career has been in and around education and around students and making sure they have exactly what they need. And so this is one piece of that process in ensuring that we have the right educators um, who are fit and ready to do the job in front of those students, so. Do you know any of the current members who sit on the Committee of Credentials or the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and if so, in what capacity? Um, I don't currently know personally anybody on the Committee of Credentials. Obviously, given my past um, work history at the Commission, I know many of the commissioners, although all of the commissioners are, are it's a it's a professional relationship in which I would have had um, any you know connection to them. So, but I do not have any personal relationships with any of the commissioners, anybody on the COC. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, please describe your knowledge of the Education Code, California Code of Regulations, and case law, 
as it relates to nexus to fitness to teach, adverse action against credentials, and the committee of credentials. I sure. There's a lot in that question. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Not a problem. Um, so just a little bit of, of background uh, in my professional life. I have worked in and around the legislature, public affairs uh, for several decades now. Uh, obviously, I was with the commission for five years, so I'm I'm well versed uh, in the education code itself and statute. I have, you know, I'm very comfortable working in and around statute, both the penal code uh, portion of statute that uh, pertains to the COC and commission work. Um, I'm familiar with the the fitness for duty requirement and what that looks like. Um, and then I, again, given both my professional history as well as my history here, um, I'm familiar with the regulatory process. I would say of all of those pieces that you talked about, um, I'm not a lawyer, so case law is not something that I know in and, you know, I can get myself in and out of really easily. However, I know there's lots of resources to, to be able to, to get that information if it pertains to a particular issue in front of the, the committee. Did I get, catch all that, Bonnie? I'm not sure if there was any other. Okay. Okay, I have a two-part question. Sure. So what strengths or qualities do you feel you possess that would be assets in serving on the COC? And what weaknesses may impact your service? Okay. Um, so again, I have a long history in, in education policy, a um, long history in, in teacher preparation policy. So, and again, my familiarity with the committee, having, having been able to, to be kind of working in and around the commission and, and, and familiar with it is, is, I would think, an asset. Um, I have been a school board member for, oh gosh, uh, almost 11 years now. So it's something that from a local perspective, um, you know, I've, I've worked in that capacity, or I should say I've volunteered in that capacity for quite a bit of time. And so, you know, I'm, I've really familiarized myself with um, kind of what happens at the employment level, which I know is oftentimes where first things occur before they come um, to the licensing side. So I'm fairly familiar with, with those processes. I also, as I mentioned, I now work for a local school district. Um, and so working in and around with teachers uh, in that capacity um, is something I do every day. So, I mean, I think my background's fairly strong. Um, as it relates to, to the work that's happening at the committee. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, something that, that will just have to be a, a work on kind of a thing is really more of a logistical piece, right? Of, uh, you know, making sure and understanding the flow of, I know there's a lot of reading, what's that going to take, right? So there's going to take some time just to make sure that I allow myself enough time to really dig into all of the, the cases before me and, and, and take the moment to uh, read through them in detail. And as I mentioned, um, you know, refresh on kind of what's been the past history as it relates to what the committee is recommending. So I'm, you know, I'm not as familiar with that because I wasn't as intimately involved in that side of, of things. So I think that'll be a piece that will take a little bit of, you know, on board. I appreciate that answer, especially the, the onboarding and the <laughs> honesty with which you're approaching. Absolutely. Because it is a workload. As you it know. is. It is. So um, this next question um, has lots of parts to it. Okay. So please okay. listen to each of the following scenarios. We'll just do one scenario at a time. Yep. That's great. For each one, please discuss whether you would close the matter or recommend discipline on the educator's credential and explain your decision-making process. So again, whether you would close the matter or recommend discipline and then why you would do that. So the first scenario is an educator has three felony drug convictions in 1997, 1998, and 1999. On each occasion, the educator used cocaine. So it's now 2022. Um, in that scenario, obviously, with only that limited amount of information, there would be, it would, you know, I, I obviously have some questions, but 1997, 98, 99, if they're a current credential holder, it means that obviously there was either disciplinary action taken prior to them being a credential holder, there would be an assumption that if there was, they were holding a, a valid license, that they had already um, passed through the fitness for duty, you know, review, whether that be at the staff level, level or otherwise. So uh, in that case, I think I would probably 
question why the individual is coming before us. If, however, they were never a credential holder, and this was the first time they were applying for a, for a credential or license with the commission, um, then that would be something that would, I, I'm not sure I would recommend discipline, but it certainly would be something that recommends, you know, some invest, further investigation. So I'm not sure I'm actually answering you because I think it depends on the scenario, but. I appreciate the response. Scenario two. An educator learned that one of his high school female students spent the night at, a, at his male colleague's residence. The educator did not report this information to law enforcement. So let me just repeat it so I make sure I understand exactly the scenario. What the question is, is whether we would be disciplining the individual who failed to report, not the individual who was actually with the female student. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so aside from the the fact that you know we do need to hopefully be able to get to investigating the other individual um i'm not sure that we would recommend discipline in this case only because um currently under statute i'm not sure again not not knowing the circumstances when this was occurring or, or whatever that um the individual is required to necessarily report that um so Again, it's not a great situation, and we would hope that somebody would do the right thing. Um, but given that it was a a um, kind of a hearsay scenario, I think that that's a difficult one. Okay, thank you. And then the final scenario: a male teacher appearing before the committee of credentials admits that he has taken one of his female students to the mall and purchased clothing for her as well as provided her transportation outside of school. The educator and student have exchanged texts regarding the student's alleged troubled home life and dating life. The student's parents have submitted an affidavit, affidavit, affidavit to the Committee on Credentials complaining of the teacher's behavior. So in that scenario, I think it's, it's you know, it warrants obviously an investigation um, through the staff and then potentially the committee. And um, it's obviously inappropriate behavior. Um, and it sounds like at least there'd be an investigation, but and that if, if all of those things were true and the um, the individual was in, you know, inappropriate in their approach, the parents were unaware, I could see discipline in that in that case. Thank you. All right, now, um, if you could consider a situation sure. um, in which most members of the Committee of Credentials feel differently than you do as to the recommendation of discipline. The deliberations indicate that five members oppose your recommendation and only one member agrees with you. How would you handle this situation? Well, there's a committee for a reason, right? So it's not one person making all the decisions, otherwise it wouldn't be in a committee uh, format. And so, you know, I think in that that situation, it's just like in any other professional uh, situation that we're, when I'm working with, with a group, um, I would hope that there would have been robust conversation, right? Everybody's opinions and, and viewpoints might be heard because we all miss things or we all view things with a different, slightly different lens. But I think ultimately, to be honest, if, you know, if I'm outvoted, I'm outvoted. And that's, again, the purpose for a committee, right? So we would, I would go with the recommendation of the majority, so. When faced with a difficult case in the committee, which do you think should be given greater weight? The protection of the teacher or the protection of school children? protection of school children. Our last question. You're very concerned about a case that you uh, read as a member of the Committee of Credentials because the case involves a close friend of yours. After you read the case, you feel that the facts reported to the commission by the district about your friend are false. You feel obligated to inform your friend and you feel that the committee should close the case and take no discipline on your friend's credentials. What issues should you consider before proceeding? So in that case, regardless of my own personal view of my friend, again, my lens of who my friend is or what they've done, um, I would be recusing myself completely. So um, 
it, it, it kind of doesn't matter um, in, in some ways how I feel personally about the individual or if I believe the facts are incorrect. It's not my decision to make at that point because I have a conflict of interest. So. We've come to the end of our questions. Do you have any questions for us? Not that I'm aware of. No, other than I just will state, and I know I stated this in my um, application, but um, I do work for a school district and then obviously I'm a school board member. So, you know, I understand in those circumstances, it would be if there were cases before me that, that involved either of those districts, I would be recusing myself. So just to be aware that I kind of have two, two uh, districts that I have to be aware of. Great. Thank you. I want to thank you. I'm very grateful for your willingness to serve on the Committee of Credentials and we thank you for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. We've heard from one school board member, Michelle Prawl, and we're here to recommend um, the appointment of one school board member to serve on the Committee of Credentials. Let's discuss our thoughts on the strengths or weaknesses of the applicant. I, I'll go ahead and start. I think um, our applicant is um, has ex great experience, um, has a clear understanding um, from multiple lenses, which I think are really important to serving on the Committee of Credentials. And I think she would um, um, be a great asset. I have no concerns. <clears throat> I think that her experience as an experienced school board member, which by its nature has to deal with employee discipline on a fairly regular basis, will give her an excellent lens to view uh, the work, knowing that there are different education codes and there are, it's, it's a different thing when we're looking about licensure rather than employment. Mm -hmm. But I think that she's an excellent candidate. And I'll add also, I, I agree with both of you. And I also appreciate the fact that it sounds like her employer is supportive because it is a very big time commitment and um, that her employer is, is aware of that commitment and supportive of that commitment, I think is really important also. So I would also support the candidate. Any other comments before we call for a motion? Do I have a motion for the selection of a school board member? I so move. I have a motion by Commissioner. <laughs> David. Simmons. <laughs> Do I have a second? I second the motion. All <laughs> right. I have a second by Commissioner Klatt. Um, Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And there was no opposed. Motion carries. Thank you again. One last statement. The ad hoc committee's recommendations for selection of the school board member on the Committee of Credentials will be presented to the Commission at the meeting on Friday, June 17th. This concludes the business before the ad hoc committee, and we are adjourned. The general session of the meeting will start at this afternoon at 1. Great, good morning, or where, where are we? Good afternoon, <laughs> We're afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Good to see you all here on a Wednesday afternoon. I will now convene the 15, June 15, 17, 2022 meeting of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Will the recording secretary please call roll? Catherine Williams Braun. Here. Jose Cardenas. Juan Cruz. Christopher Davis. Here. Michael Dilatori. Present. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo, Anna Marie Francois, Makita Grenoshire, present, Megan Gross, present, Johanna Harwick, Susan Aradia, Terry Jackson, here, Bonnie Kla, present, Monica Martinez, David Simon, here, Tina Sloan, here, Kimberly Weissmith, Donetta Brown. We have a quorum.
Wonderful. Commissioner De La Torre, would you lead us in the ple uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Great. Please stand. Place the flag. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome Danette Brown as the new teacher representative. Welcome. Uh, Commissioner Brown is no stranger to this room. She is also an elementary educator in La Havre City School District, and she also works with Orange County Department of Education as an OCDE project GLAD field consultant. Ms. Brown brings over 27 years of experience working in public education. She received her bachelor's degree in art history from CSU Fullerton and went on to earn a multiple subjects teaching credential. Since 1996, Ms. Brown served as a fourth grade teacher, reading specialist, Title I coordinator, and academic coach. Ms. Brown received a master's degree in teaching and a reading specialist certificate from National University. She currently serves as a teacher on special assignment to support the design and imp implementation of the district's multi-tiered systems of support. Ms. Brown advocates for recognizing each student's unique assets and creating an environment where all students can be successful with particular emphasis on supporting multilingual learners. She's uh, designed and delivered professional learning in collaboration with Orange County Department of Ed and the California Association for Bilingual Education as part of the Multilingual California Project Grant. And she serves as her district's English Learner Committee lead. As an active member of the California Teachers Association, Ms. Brown has served as a liaison to the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, that would be us. Uh, liaison to the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, State Council of Credentials and Professional Development Committee Chair, and Good Teaching Conference Planning Committee Chair. Additionally, she has served on a variety of work groups, including the Early Childhood Credentialing Work Group, Collaborative Work Group on COVID-19 Impact, Literacy Expert Work Group, and Administrative Services Credential Standards Writing Group. Welcome, Ms. Brown. All right, uh, I'd like to remind everyone about the meeting procedures before we get to today's agenda. This meeting is being conducted at the commission office via teleconference. Commissioners and commission staff are participating from the commission building and the public has the option to attend the general session of the meeting at the commission office or participate remotely through Zoom webcast or a US toll-free phone number. Uh, with respect to microphones, for those participating from the Commission office, the microphones must be turned on before you start to speak by pushing the button and then turning off once you're finished. You'll know the microphone is on when the indicator light shows green. The microphones for individuals who are attending via teleconference have been muted to eliminate any background noise that may hinder others from hearing what's being said. With respect to Zoom identification, we'd like to ask members of the public who attend the meeting via Zoom that you, uh, and if you would like to make public comment, please check your Zoom identification. Your Zoom identification is the name used when logging into the meeting. It's important that your identification is accurate so we can call on you appropriately during public comment. Next, we'll cover the public comment procedures. The committee chair will announce when public comment period is open during the presentation of the agenda item and ask for anyone who wishes to comment to notify the meeting moderator. Individuals who attend the meeting at the commission office here will need to submit a request to address the commission card to the meeting operator, the meeting moderator, oh, moderator. The meeting moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak. At that time, the individual will be able to approach the microphone and share their comment. Individuals who joined the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raise hand icon to inform the meeting moderator that they'd like to speak to the item. The moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak by calling their Zoom ID. At that time, the individual will be prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. The Zoom ID name used by the member of the public to join the Zoom meeting will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. 
Individuals who join the meeting through the US toll-free number will need to press star nine on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that they would like to speak on an item. The moderator will notify the individual it's their turn to speak by calling their phone number and will allow them to unmute their telephone. At that time, the individual will, will be prompted to press star six and will be able to share their comment. Please note only a partial phone number will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. Each of our committee chairs will have the discretion to set a time limit on comments depending on the volume of speakers seeking to speak on a particular item. We ask that you keep your remarks brief and focused on the particular item you're speaking to. Finally, with respect to recording, please note this meeting is being recorded after the meeting. The archived audio and video will be available via the commission's website. All right. Item 2A is approval of the April 2022 minutes. First, do I have a motion from a member of the ad hoc committee to approve the April 2022 ad hoc committee minutes? I'd like to remind everyone that only those who served on the committee can make and second the motion to approve the committee minutes. Do I have a motion? The committee members are Megan Gross, <laughs> Marquita de Grandeshire and David Simmons. I can make a motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Gross. I have a motion by Commissioner Gross. Do I have a second? I will second. Seconded by C Commissioner Simmons. All right. Um, for the discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, next do I have a motion to approve the April 2022 commission meeting minutes. Uh, moved by Commissioner Martinez. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Davis. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, agenda item 2B, approval of the June 2022 agenda. We have agenda inserts for items 2C, 3A, 3D, and 3B, oh, 5B. Sorry, let me say that again so I don't confuse people. Agenda inserts for 2C, 3A, 3D, 5B, and a handout for item 3C. Do I have a motion to approve the June 2022 agenda? Moved by Commissioner Klatt. Do I have a second? Second, okay. Seconded by Commissioner Gross, thank you. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Extensions? Motion carries. All right, agenda item 2C is a approval of the June 2022 consent calendar. Do commissioners have any items they would like to consider in closed session? Commissioner Gross. Um, I would like to pull uh, number 62, McKinsey, and number um, 678, Podell. Okay. Any other commissioners? All right, uh, Commissioner Jackson. Uh, yes, I'd like to recuse, recuse myself from number five, Baker. Okay. All right, and oh, number see. five, Baker. Thank you. And um, sorry, I'm pulling up. You've got it. Okay. We have um, items to pull from Commissioner Hartwig, um, Executive Com Director Sandy, can you? Commissioner Hartwig uh, placed a request that uh, items 51, Robert Jacobo, or Jacobo, number 56, Thomas Laufenberger, number 62, Gregory McKinsey, and number 65, Jonathan Masisco, must be pulled on behalf of uh, Commissioner Hartwig. All right, <clears throat> any other items? Okay, further discussion? Um, do I have a motion to approve all the remaining items on the consent calendar?
<laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Klatt. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Martinez. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. All right. So uh, there were many things that I could say today. There's so many things going on in the world, but one of the probably key things that have been happening most recently is graduation season. And this was a year uh, unlike many years. And there is, is much to be thankful and hopeful for in addition to all of the things that we know is hard. At my university, I think I attended graduation probably 15 years in a row when I was director of the teacher education program. And for each and every newly credentialed educator, I got to shake their hands and congratulate them. And, um, and they were excited. It was a really big accomplishment. It, it is every time. We work them so hard <laughs> from middle of June until August. They are full-time uh, classrooms at 7.30 in the morning at the university till 7.30 at night and working all weekend. So by the time they get to graduation, they're exuberant, they're excited. And um, in fact, sometimes that exuberance went um, a little further than the university officials wanted in that very somber graduate um, graduation. So it was their graduate students. And um, so there was a few years where I had to sit with them down in the field and <laughs> be sure they were. Uh, nonetheless, the chancellor would usually give them a shout out because they would respond right back. And um, they were just so full of hope despite how much debt they were in, despite the fact they didn't have a job because there was a time when jobs were pretty scarce. Um, and it was always, I always left so hopeful for our future. And I don't know if it's old age, but, um, or the fact that I, I don't get to be with those students all the time like I used to. There are aspiring educators, but um, I think like a, Many people I know, uh, I've been feeling a lot more sad and hopeless of late. Um, yesterday, I heard a story from a friend whose brother um, was had opened his home to uh, a young woman who is a teacher uh, in a school here in our state. And um, a student in this teacher's class had threatened to bring a gun to school, had threatened to shoot her. Um, and, and other students in the class. And um, for a number of reasons, and I don't know the details of the story, but um, though the student was kept out of school for a short period of time, suddenly the student was back in her class and she wasn't notified. And, and so she felt very scared and she left a and she felt scared to go home. So she went to my friend's brother's house. Um, today I read a story this was yesterday. This was yesterday when I was talking to my friend. And then today I was reading a story that federal law requires that the semi-automatic shotguns used to hunt migratory waterfowl must be plugged, quote unquote, to prevent them from firing more than three rounds before loading. And, and the idea is to give ducks a fair chance of escape before being killed. So these are the things that we hear daily. Um, but this is where, this is where I was this year at graduation. And then before graduation, even though I haven't spent years, um, with, uh, this year with my students in the teacher education program, because I was on sabbatical for part of this year. So I didn't get to teach them the way I normally do. And maybe that is why I didn't, I didn't know where they were, but I was worried that they're at a place of why am I becoming a teacher, this is what I question. You know, uh, it, it, it's the things that teachers are being asked to do. Um, so I did get to see them last week though, because at the end of the year, they uh, do their master's defenses and faculty get to be a part of their defense and some of their fellow students get to be a part of it. They do a presentation, we query them. They all came in the room, I, we had eight in our room and they were, they were really nervous. 
Um, and they were, um, they gave spectacular presentations. I mean, you, you know, teachers, whenever we have donors coming to the school, we always ask one of the teacher education students to do a presentation because they're so much better than <laughs> anyone else. And they're, they're so good. And they've studying something, some aspect of their classroom practice over this past year or students or what they're learning, whatever it is that is their passion. So it's the emotional learning or identity or, um, Oh, collaborative learning is always a big one. And and when it was over, they were all good. And we we discussed them and then we called them and we congratulated them. They had passed. And they literally almost jumped out of their chairs. I thought they were going to dance on the tables. And, and I was so happy to see that um, because they were so excited and full of hope. And they're bringing that to their schools and their colleagues and their kids this year. And, and it's such a gift. And and we have to have their backs. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir. We do have their backs. In this room, everybody here has their backs, but everybody else has to have their backs. Um, we have to stop the insanity. We have to stop the NRA. We have to protect our children and teachers, and we have to allow them to make their schools a place of hope. Today, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And, and it it's... There's so many critical issues that people care deeply about. And, and we're hitting some of the big ones today, early childhood, performance assessments, subject matter preparation, literacy preparation, ethnic studies, misassignments. I mean, we've got, and, and every person who's speaking here today cares um, that teachers are equipped to do what they need to do for students. And um, we're gonna be hearing opposing views on the same topics. Um, and we'll hear collective understandings and we'll hear some misunderstandings. And it's our job uh, today as it is at every meeting to listen well and to deliberate and to make decisions and to remember who we're doing this for. It's for our students and our children and our new teachers and we'll be inspired by our new teachers um, who are ready to enter our classrooms. And we're gonna work hard today as we do every time we're together to um, ensure that our students get excited and prepared and hopeful teachers. All right, so with that, I would like to turn it over to our executive director, Mary Sandy, for the executive director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate kind of understanding and hearing and the reminder of where we are seasonally with graduations and with summer vacations and with all the trappings that, uh, you know, in our in our normal lives, uh, these are moments when the sun gets warmer and the water gets cooler and we begin to relax and recreate. And there is this overlay of incredible social tension that we're all addressing. And, and we can't put that aside. We have to keep it in the foreground while we do our work. So thank you for, for bringing that together so poignantly. I find uh, my engagements with new teachers as they're coming out of preparation and getting into practice is truly one of the most inspiring conversations I get to have that. And with people who are asking me for to write them letters of recommendation to get into preparation. I love talking to those young people because their sense of mission and drive and what they want to do is so right. And it reminds me that there's a lot right with the world. And, and there are some definite things that are wrong with the world. And, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to work with us on our, on our part of it. Uh, we do have a packed agenda for you commissioners. A lot of major initiatives that we've been working on have a landing zone here at this meeting and an opportunity for your deep discussion and engagement with the public to hear the various diverse viewpoints about what you should do as a body uh, and to deliberate fully and to make decisions. Um, so we have three full days of that for you, and we're grateful that, uh, that you're all here and that, uh, that we have this opportunity to engage and keep the work moving forward. I would like to introduce a new member of the staff uh, who joined us uh, just recently, um, and that is uh, Dr. Lynn Larson. Dr. Larson, are you in the room? I am not sure you are yet. Okay. Well, I will introduce her and when she comes, we'll point her out to you. So Dr. Larson joined our staff as a member of our grants team in the professional services division. Uh, she earned her doctorate at the University of Maryland after teaching middle and high school special education in Indiana and New York. 
She joined Chapman uh, University College in 2004, serving as a full-time faculty member, was promoted to full professor in 2017. While serving as associate dean from 2010 to 2017, she oversaw programs in special education, school psychology, and counseling, uh, CTEL, and the Master of Arts in Education. She was awarded Outstanding Faculty of the Year for service to the university and was the first education adjunct faculty to be awarded the non-Senate faculty researcher slash lecturer collaborator of the year. I don't know how you fit all that on one plaque. Um, okay, it's a big plaque at UC Riverside in 2003. She has been involved in numerous scholarly presentations and publications related to teacher and program assessment and served uh, the commission as a member of the Board of Institutional Reviewers since 2012. Uh, in addition to her work for the university, she was a volunteer coach and district coordinator for Odyssey of the Mind, an international creativity program. The teams coached with her husband, uh, won numerous regional and state titles and advanced to the world finals. She has served as the volunteer state director for the organization for the past nine years. Dr. Larson uh, indicates that she's thrilled to join the professional services division team. And we're quite thrilled to welcome her to the team as we go. Oh, I, there she is, she's on screen. Dr. Larson, hello. Would you like to say good afternoon to the commission? Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm thrilled to be on board with CTC as a consultant. I enjoyed my time on the Committee on Accreditation, and I'm happy to bring that knowledge and expertise and my knowledge as a professor to this role as consultant. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to see you. I'm not quite in person, but, but that's coming. <laughs> I know it. So, uh, so. Um, I also wanted to just let you know, commissioners, that it is that time of year again when application, applications for the student liaison uh, are open. And the application process currently closes June 30th, uh, but will be extended until we have uh, candidates for your consideration. So if you know of any candidates enrolled in, in preparation programs, this would be a great uh, opportunity to bring them to the table. Um, the applications are available online. Uh, that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mary. Do any commissioners have items to report? Commissioner Brown. Thank you both for those um, telling and memorable words and thinking. Yes, it's it's a big day um, in a lot of ways. Um, but thinking about what you were talking about, about graduation, I just wanted to report on on behalf of the Community Colleges of California. Uh, we completed our academic year um, with some adjustments uh, towards more uh, offering more courses hybrid, um, and then also trying to get back in person a little bit um, for spring. Um, we had mask mandates uh, indoors and you needed proof of vaccination or exemption to register for classes. Um, that still stands right now. Um, but we, it was, it was great because many of us um, got to conduct uh, on-campus or live um, outdoor commencements, um, which we hadn't done since 2019. Um, we then, for us, our, our little R program, we always do a department celebration and we do it at the Child Development Lab School. And we invite um, people who are receiving uh, certificates and degrees and their families. The place is packed. We couldn't really serve food, so everybody got a little snack bag. But the Child Development Lab School is a former elementary school, so it has a little stage. So while they didn't wear caps and gowns, we got to call their names, say what they had received, and what their and we had them dream out loud. And then they got to cross the stage, and we had swag for them. And the families were thrilled. The first thing I did when I welcomed everyone is I asked everyone who was a friend and family of the of the um, students to stand up and they were a little nervous like they were going to get in trouble you know that that teacher voice um, and then I said a round of applause for all the support that you've given to the students and the whole place just broke out in in cheers and I think they were as much thrilled to be with their families and so and and celebrate as they were to just be in a room with other people um, so that was really exciting uh, then I got a call um, from the faculty senate president um say i'm because i'm a past president of the faculty senate um for some advice she said um 
tomorrow is the graduate is our graduation outdoor graduation and we just did the um, the rehearsal and one of our faculty readers has just called me and he came down with covid what can i what should i do and i said well what you should do is you should ask me if i might pinch hit to be a reader <laughs> really yes and it was thrilling to be up on the dais to be able to um you know, call out the delightful to call out their names, but also we were sharing the same sash. And so there was an early there was an early childhood person reading with the early childhood sash and all of the early childhood people coming over and then they'd look and their families would stand up. It was just really fun. And I know it's a serious and sad time in the world. And I know that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of trepidation and a lot of difficulty in doing what's good and right for children on behalf of their families and the teachers. But I tell you, it was really pretty exciting being able to see those future teachers cross the stage and turn to their families and go, woohoo. So yeah, I just wanted to report that because there's that in the world too. Good, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Other commissioners? Commissioner Mark Mar Mar Griller Shire. <laughs> Got this. So, like many of you, I've been vacillating back and forth between hope and despair, and I appreciate Chair Sloan setting that context as we spend the next three days together deliberating such critical items. And so, I want to share a poem with you. And some of you may have heard this poem. It is a crowdsourced poem in praise of teachers that was. Um, on NPR in May because of Teacher Appreciation Month. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because we'd be here all afternoon. Um, but um, they have a poet in residence, Kwame Alexander, who put this call out to the field and received over 300 responses. Um, so I'm just gonna share a short segment then I'll send the link around. And this poem is dedicated to all teachers, but especially to Irma Garcia, and Eva Morales, fourth grade teachers who lost their lives in Ovalde. <clears throat> who will clean out the desks? Teachers make a dent, a soft curve in the gray matter, a crevice where light shines in, a seed to germinate. <clears throat> they open eyes, kick open imagination, make us see, encourage change of mind and change of heart, not to force the walking of a single path, but the revelation of many. Teachers make and shape, they weave through the constraints on their vision, creating and molding the students. Teachers celebrate, teachers conquer hate and foster expectation. Teachers make light go where darkness has resided, make chrysanthemums of wildflower seeds, tall stems and fragile blossoms exploding in their reach. I will send this around. We look forward to getting that, thank you. Marquita, thank you. Other commissioners, items to report, share. You're all tired from reading all the items you had to read for today. All right. Uh, do any liaisons have items to report? Wonderful. Commissioner, can you hear me okay? Liaison Rodriguez. All right. Um, and yes, thank you so much for that beautiful contrast, which is the complicated life that we live. Um, because I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, and um, after, after the uh, shootings in Uvalde, I was asked uh, to uh, be on NPR as well and talk to a few teachers actually we shared our experiences and one of one of the questions was does your family ever try to get you to find another profession and i said no they wouldn't dream of doing that this is what i love and this is what i do and we're here for our students um, because we do have such an impact so thank you um, you know and there is there's in everything there's there's joy i, I feel a lot of joy with my students and a lot of hope with my students and i think that one of, the, one of the comments that somebody from the East Coast who heard the interview came away with was, it's amazing what teachers do to prepare to support their students and process 
difficult situations. So um, that's what we do. Um, all right, so uh, this is my state board report. Uh, national board certification. Uh, as many of you likely know, uh, the California Department of Education is administering uh, 2021 disbursements of $250 million to provide stipends to national board certified teachers or NBCTs as we call them, right, Michael? Um, to teach in high need schools and to support teachers in high need schools to become national board certified. Um, as an NBCT myself, uh, who teaches in a high need school, I am particularly proud of these year one numbers um, of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards Certification Incentive Program. So 1,818 teachers in high priority schools pursued National Board certification this year compared to 341 from the previous year. Um, 1,955 National Board certified teachers uh, in high priority schools will receive the first $5,000 installment of the uh, $25,000 incentive award. CDE has done great work with outreach, partnering with professional networks and labor groups and administering the program to get these great results. And it's just, there's more and more interest. So again, I'm very excited about this. Um, and another item that um, is close to my heart is community schools. Uh, last month, the state board approved the first grants to districts, county offices and charters uh, to plan for and implement community schools across the state as part of the nation's largest investment in this whole child approach to education and pandemic recovery. The board approved nearly $650 million of the $3 billion allocated to help hundreds of high need schools to expand upon and organize resources to engage educators, students and families to address persistent educational, social, emotional, and health needs. The grants approved by the state board are spread over three categories, um, up to two year planning grants of $200,000, and um, which were allocated to 192 uh, school districts, county offices of education and charter schools uh, without community schools. A total of 38.2 million um, five-year implementation grants of up to half a million per school site allocated to 76 districts, county offices of education, and charter schools, um, expanded or continuing community school programs. This represents 458 school sites, um, each serving 80% high-need students, so it's a total of 611 million. Um, a lead technical assistance center grant to the Alameda County Office of Education, um, that will act as a support hub for the program, co-led with the UCLA Center for Community Schooling and in partnership with Californians for Justice and the NEA, a three-year $12 million contract. In all, a total of 268 school districts, county offices of education and charter schools are recipients of these grants. This is a strong start. We hope others, particularly LEAs with our highest need schools, will consider joining for the 22-23 school year. Um, and then also uh, with uh, related to assessment, uh, and this is a very long item, so I'm gonna make it, you know, I mean, like assessment, right? We wanna talk about that. Um, we wanna move on with our thick agenda. Um, also, last month, the State Board approved CDE's proposed 2021-22 uh, apportionment rates um, for the CASP and uh, the English Language Proficiency Assessments, the LPAC. Um, also approved the State Superintendent of Public Instructions proposed al alternate LPAC threshold for 21 and 22 and beyond. If you'd like more information, I'm happy to share it with you, but I won't take you through the weeds. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Liaison Rodriguez. Um, any other uh, liaisons have items to report? Okay, good. I will now recess the general session and move to the Educator Preparation Committee. Commissioner Martinez, will you please convene the committee?
I'll clearly move a little to the left from Chair Sloan. <laughs> no, I'm good. Yeah. We don't. We have empty space here. We're all good. So. Uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon. See, I'm used to us beginning in the morning, right? So uh, you all are very lucky that we're splitting up these days because it means only three items today out of 10. <laughs> um, so there's um, there's like a silver lining to a three-day meeting. Um, you get to break it all up. So um, I'd like to call the June 2020, 2022 meeting of the Educator Prep Committee in, to order. Uh, like I said, we have 10 agenda items. Three of them are today. Um, we'll have five tomorrow and two more on Friday. So we just like to spread them out and keep you waiting. And uh, we'll announce when the public comment period is open following the presentation of each agenda item. Members of the public who wish to comment will be asked to notify the meeting moderator in the following ways. Individuals attending the meeting at the commission office will need to submit a request to address the commission card to the meeting moderator. The meeting moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak. At that time, the individual will be able to approach the microphone and share their comment. Individuals who join the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raise hand icon to inform the meeting moderator that they'd like to speak on the item. Meeting moderator will then notify the individual when it's their turn to speak by calling out their Zoom ID. Please remember that the Zoom ID is the name used when logging into the meeting. At that time, the individual will be prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. And then for those who are gonna join the meeting via the US toll-free number, they'll need to press star nine on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that they'd like to speak on the item. Meeting moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn um, to speak by calling out the last four digits of the phone number and that allow them to unmute their phone. At that time, the individual will be prompted to press star six and will be able to share their comment. Um, so we have three different ways that folks can make comments and we appreciate those opportunities. Please note that the order of today's um, items have been changed. We're gonna actually start with item 3C. It'll be presented first and then it's gonna be followed by 3A and then 3B. So with all of that as context, <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and start with 3C. Our first item for today's 3, 3C, report to the legislator on the implementation of the Senate Bill 488 teacher credentialing reading instruction. This item is being presented by Nancy Burleson and Roxanne Perdue. This is an action item, commissioners. Ms. Perdue, will you please begin? Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's nice to see you all in person again. Um, before we get started, actually, just so there's no confusion in case you're following along in um, either online or on hard copy today, um, our agenda item starts out numbering for the actual agenda item and then moves on to numbering for the report to the legislature. So there'll be two page ones, for example. Mm -hmm. So you'll just want to um, note when we refer you to a page that we'll say it's the report to the legislature on that page. With that, before you today is agenda item 3C, which presents the first annual report to the legislature on implementation of Senate Bill 488 or SB 488. If approved, staff will transmit the report to the legislature prior to the July 1st deadline specified in statute. SB 488 requires that the commission annually report the progress on implementing the bill, including how constituencies were engaged in that process. SB 488 requires the commission's standards and quality of quality and effectiveness and that the teacher performance expectations or TPEs align with the state board approved English language arts English language development or ELA ELD framework and incorporate the California Department of Education's dyslexia guidelines. While statute refers to the framework and the dyslexia guidelines specifically it is important to note that the framework serves as a guide for implementing two sets of state board adopted K-12 standards, the ELA literacy standards and the ELD standards. Additionally, other state documents related to literacy have been um, considered in developing these standards and TPEs. The primary requirements um, that are established by SB 48 include but are not limited to the following. By September 1st, 2022, ensure that all requirements regarding the content of teacher preparation in literacy instruction and education code subsections A and B of 44259B4, and I promise not to quote every ad code in here, but that's, that's a big one for you, um, are included in the standards for the preliminary multiple subject, the education specialist, and the single subject English credentials. While not required to be assessed by the new performance assessment for literacy instruction, single subject programs for English are required to address the standards and performance expectations related to literacy instruction within their coursework. 
In accordance with the section of statute, comprehensive reading instruction must be research-based and include the study of organized, systematic, explicit skills, including phonemic awareness, direct, systematic, and explicit phonics, and decoding skills. Additionally, a strong literature, language, and comprehension component with a balance of oral and written language must be included, as well as ongoing diagnostic techniques that inform teaching and assessment, early intervention techniques, and guided practice in a clinical setting. So that's a big task before us for 2022, September 1st. September 1st, 2024, we are to ensure that uh, all of the commission standards and TPs for preliminary multiple subject, single subject English language arts and ed specialists, education specialists. Programs must include satisfactory completion of a research-based comprehensive reading instruction, direct, systematic, explicit phonics, all of the requirements of existing law for the content of teacher preparation and literacy instruction, including those added by this measure, such as the incorporation of the California Dyslexia Guidelines and alignment to the ELA ELD framework. And the multiple subject credentials and education specialist credentials also are to include the study of integrated methods of teaching language arts. Number three, by July 1st, 2025, the big deadline, the commission must develop and implement a literacy instruction performance assessment that assesses all multiple subject and education specialist candidates for completion of an effective means of teaching literacy, including but not limited to evidence-based methods of teaching foundational reading skills. And then finally, number four that I'll cover for you um, on this item is before requiring successful passage of that performance assessment, the commission must certify that the teacher education programs approved by the commission offer instruction in the knowledge, skills, and abilities required by the assessment. So a certification process will need to occur as part of the accreditation process. Nancy Brennison will now share with you some of the progress we have made so far. commissioners as I learn to push the button. Um, two major uh, accomplishments, work in progress, I should say, uh, are what I will address. First, the formation of a literacy work group to advise the commission regarding the implementation of SB 488 and also the development of a resource guide. So I'll start by talking about our work group. Uh, Executive Director Sandy appointed a work group of 27 members and two liaisons uh, who represent a broad base of constituents and experts to assist with the implementation of 488. The members were selected from over 60 individuals. They represent a broad range of expertise and perspectives and different roles. They are, for example, university and college faculty, researchers, uh, school district and county office of education administrators, classroom teachers, and policy advocates. They have expertise and experiences in comprehensive English language arts, English language development, dyslexia, special education, multilingual education, and teacher preparation, and I'm sure much more. Um, and you will find their names in Appendix A in the report to the legislature so, and their institutions. The charge to this work group is to make recommendations to the commission regarding educator preparation program standards, and related literacy teaching performance expectations or TPEs for four types of credentials, multiple subject, single subject, education specialist, and the proposed PK3 ECE specialist credential. So all four of these credentials would have a literacy standard and literacy TPEs. The approach that's currently under consideration is a dedicated literacy program standard and updated literacy TPEs for each of these credential types. The literacy TPEs uh, would be distinct 
and comprise a seventh domain in the TPEs, in our current TPEs. The first meeting of this group was in May, and part of it was to explain the chart, make sure everybody knew what they were doing. Uh, they were given an orientation to program standards, TPEs, and the accreditation system. Work group members spent the bulk of their time looking at a draft program standard just for multiple subjects, single subject, and ed specialist. Uh, they provided feedback in small groups and then in a large group. Overall, the feedback was that the standard aligned with the ELA, ELD framework and incorporated the dyslexia guidelines. However, members commented that the structure of the standard was a little confusing or unclear and that the treatment of the themes of the framework beyond foundational skills was uneven. The standard has since been revised and distributed to the work group members because we have a meeting next week. And, this, and it will be discussed at the June 21st meeting. In addition, TPEs for literacy for three of the credentials, multiple, single, and as specialist, will be considered uh, during the June 21st meeting. The uh, PK3 ECE standard and TPEs is scheduled to be addressed during the July 12th meeting because you have that item on your agenda today. So we want to give that a little bit of time. The schedule of all future work group meetings appears on page three of the legislative report. So you can see when we're scheduled to meet. Turning now to the second uh, product that will remain in development probably throughout this process uh, is the resource guide. So it's a resource guide on preparing teachers for effective literacy instruction. This is intended to support teacher preparation programs as they work to update coursework, their offerings, their clinical practice, to implement SB 488. Um, the resource guide details literacy content and pedagogy based on state board adopted standards for ELA literacy and ELD and the ELA ELD framework. The California Dyslexia Guidelines, the Comprehensive State Literacy Plan and other state documents. It brings together in one place all the details, as, as many as we could provide in 60 pages or so, um, of the expectations for student learning, teaching pedagogy, including assessment. From multiple critical state initi initiatives. So um, I've called it a one-stop shop uh, guidance. But again, it is a resource. It's not a list of requirements, it's something intended to support their work. You may recall that you reviewed an earlier draft of this very resource guide, it's had a few different names, but that was back in February, so we thought it was time to at least uh, bring it back to your attention. The current draft of the resource guide is linked in the legislative report on page three, so you can click on that to uh, access all of it, although today you were provided with the first five pages on green paper, um, just to give you a sense of how it's evolved and what is in, the re in that resource guide. From the table of contents on the first page, you can see that the guide begins with the comprehensive and integrated literacy model as set forth by the state literacy plan. And that includes the items you see there, multi-tiered system of support. That's where we address first best instruction, strategic and targeted instruction for students who need that, and supplemental support, among other items. Access and equity. 
includes such items as diversity, universal design for learning, asset-based approaches. And then following on with instruction that is developmentally and age appropriate, that's a new section in this document. Uh, instruction for multilingual and English learner students, California dyslexia guidelines, and assessment. This section was added to the resource guide because of all of the recent work that the State Board of Education and CDE have done and making sure that these overarching items are made clear to programs as they work on implementing 488. Following on in the resource guide then um, are sections that are aligned with the themes in the ELA ELD framework. So we have foundational skills, meaning making, language development, effective expression, and content knowledge, and followed by four appendixes. Um, you can see from the subheadings under each one of these themes what is addressed in each one. And this is consistent with the way the framework is organized. To accomplish the overarching goals listed on page four of the introduction. So you can uh, take a look at the introduction, but it's marked as page four here. And become effective readers, writers, listeners, speakers, presenters, users of language and technology and critical thinkers. Children and young people must have a strong foundation in phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, and fluency, coupled with simultaneous development in language, comprehension, expression, and content. These components are all interdependent and equally important. The draft you see today was revised based on constituent feedback and your feedback uh, from that February meeting. When we invited constituents to comment, we received 42 responses. Um, and those, all of that taken together resulted in revisions. The revisions clarified the role of classroom teachers and specialists in the diagnosis of dyslexia offered more specific guidance on integrated and designated ELD, expanded the support for, multi, for biliteracy and multilingualism, and incorporated guidance for pre-kindergarten children as well as adolescents. And it will continue to expand um, as we move through this process. Roxanne will now talk about next steps. Thank you, Nancy. So for next steps, um, there's multiple timelines to consider. And when you look at the actual report, you'll see that there's a little timeline that's sort of brief and that's um, on the performance assessment. And then there's a longer, more detailed timeline that goes into all the details of developing the standards and the TPEs, um, as well as all other um, related work. So, um, an overview of the work on the development of the literacy performance assessment is provided on page four of the report. Once the TPEs are approved, assuming they are approved, we will move forward with the development of performance assessment required by SB 488 as charged by the statute. A representative design team of educators with literacy expertise will be appointed in the fall of 2022. A full timeline for implementation of the bill is available on page five of the report. It delineates the work from this day forward, but does not reflect past dates of work already completed. As noted on the timeline, our next step will be a second meeting of the literacy work group on June 21st next week. And then they will review and provide input on the revised draft literacy standards and the draft literacy TPEs. These drafts will be provided, will be updated based on the feedback from our work group and then go out for a field review during the summer. Field reviews are important as a part of our work to make sure that we're engaging our constituencies and our public and the public. As noted on the timeline, 
following additional updates after the summer feedback and feedback from you here at the commission on at our next meeting um, staff will take those drafts and revise them again and they'll come forward to you first for information and input at the august commission meeting and then they'll come back to you again for approval consideration of approval um, at the october meeting once we have an approved set of literacy standards and TPE, staff will provide technical assistance for preparation programs as they update their programs and curriculum. The programs will have two years to develop a new curriculum and have it approved by their various academic governance bodies before review and certification process by the commission. Commission is to ensure that they are in compliance with the new literacy standards and TPEs as part of that certification process as required by SB 488. That work will need to be completed prior to the new performance assessment becoming operational on July 1st, 2025. As an additional note, in order to further involve our constituencies and the public in this important work, we've established a new dedicated literacy email box and listserv. Information on those two items can be found on page four of the report to the legislature and encourage everyone to um, log on and hit the link and sign up for the listserv so you can be apprised of the work group um, information and all information related to SB 488. It's another way to engage our stakeholders and the public. Um, just to indulge me, I'm going to do a brief plug, a commercial, if you will, for um, a new grant that we have for dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, it helps support the work that the institutions would need to do, the preliminary programs, in order to um, develop their curriculum or even to be used for professional learning for faculty. Mm -hmm. um, so the dyslexia grants are actually due on Friday by 5 p.m. So if you're hearing this for the first time now, mm -hmm. it's an actually a really streamlined application, I promise. Um, it is, and so it's possible to get it done now. So yes, I encourage everyone out there to apply if you have a preliminary program. And that's the end of, of my commercial. But with that, staff recommends that the commission approve the report to the legislature on Senate Bill 48, teacher credentialing reading instruction, and for transmittal to the legislature by July 1st, our deadline. That concludes our report on this item, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you both. And most of all, thank you for the public service announcement that the dyslexia grants are due in two <laughs> days um, this week. So thank you for that. Um, we're now going to open for public comments. If there are members of the public that would like to give a presentation, please notify the meeting moderator by submitting the request card clicking on the raise hand icon if you're on Zoom or pressing star nine if you're participating by phone. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? Manuel Buen Rostro. Please go up to the microphone yeah. and, and then share just your remember comment. To press the button so it turns green so we can hear you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, commission members. My first time for providing public comment in person in a while, so happy yeah. to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm Manuel Monrostro with Californians Together, and I'm just here to thank the commission and uh, the, the writers of um, the program standards for taking in so much public feedback and incorporating a lot of the feedback that has been received over the last couple of months. In particular, we're happy to see additional guidance on designated and integrated ELD uh, within uh, within the guide. We're happy to see additional support for, uh, for biliteracy and multilingualism. Uh, we think this is critical. It's aligned to the California English Learner Roadmap. It's aligned to California's Global 2030 goals to ensure that half of our students are enrolled in, in pathways towards biliteracy by the year 2030. Um, and we just see this as a critical, critically important uh, journey that we're going on. Um, as you continue to update the TPAs and program standards, we will continue to advocate for a balanced literacy approach that incorporates all of the language domains that are so critical for our multilingual students and English learners. Uh, so thank you again, and it's exciting to be here in person. Thank you. Recording secretary. Rex, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Yes, can you hear me? We can. 
Okay. My, my only comment is that I appreciate the uh, fact that you're doing uh, outreaching for um, uh, stakeholder, a, a stake, stakeholder comments and, and, and input. Uh, it is very important that uh, you continue to do that and reach as many pe people, especially parents and other teachers and uh, site leaders as, as you can um, in going toward getting this uh, placed because their feedback is so important to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Recording secretary. Just giving it a moment. There are no additional public comments on this item. Okay. Like the recording secretary, I'll give a couple seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the public comment period for this item. Now, do commissioners have questions or comments on this item? As a reminder, we are to approve the report, though you may have questions, of course, on the standards or the process the staff is undergoing to implement Senate Bill 488 teacher credentialing reading instruction. Comments by the commissioners, questions? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Francois, okay. You both, you both will get to go, I promise. <laughs> we won't arm wrestle, you'll both get to go, it's all right. Commissioner Francois, okay, Commissioner Gross, please. Okay, I have, I have two things. The first is um, a question on the timeline on page five. Um, and I, my question is, um, did you want to include your, your first meeting on that time frame? Um, I'm worried that you're not giving yourselves credit for the work you've already done in implementing this. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm somebody who's skim reading, I might go, they just started in June and the report's due tomorrow. Like I, um, maybe that's the teacher in me because we're always kind of suspicious about when did our students start this assignment. Um, so I would love to see you give yourselves credit because you have been engaging with the field and um, you know already convening work group meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that, that was just kind of my my question and my recommendation for that that time that timeline table on page five. Um, yeah, uh, we mentioned it in the item in in the um, text, but you're right. If you were um, like most of us going down to the chart, <laughs> it would be true. Okay. They wouldn't realize the work we'd engaged in prior to it. So that's a good feedback. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then my other um, part of feedback that's separate from this report is um, uh, as you look at. Um, continuing your draft resource guide. Um, I would really like to encourage, um, just as you've called out our multilingual learners, um, I, I really would like to see a call out for our students with disabilities. Um, our students with disabilities are often left out of language with rich environments and classrooms. Um, and to meet our targets for serving students in the least restrictive environment, I really think all of our teachers need to know um, how to address literacy. Um, for all students. And I, I know having read through the guide, it's in there in the access and equity piece. Um, but I think that like kind of bulleted reminder, just like we provide for our multilingual students um, would be a really powerful um, tool for programs to you know ensure that everybody has access. That's the number one thing I hear from general education teachers is I wasn't prepared to do this. Um, and so, we know that we have students with learning disabilities, students with autism, um, students with Down syndrome, all sorts of disabilities in our gen ed classrooms. Um, we have students with first grade reading levels in sixth grade classrooms, and our teachers need to know how to scaffold those literacy activities. So um, I would strongly love, I would love to see that the next revision, um, a, a call out for those, those practices and scaffolds. So, thank you very much for your work. It was very clear and, and I appreciate it very much. Okay, now Commissioner Francois. Thank you. Um, I too really appreciate the calling out of multilingual English language learners. I can't imagine how difficult this work is. Um, but I kind of want to take up what Commissioner Gross said. Under the organizing themes, I think that's what you call it. Let's see, <laughs> the cross cutting themes, I see access and equity in which in, in, in brought together within access and equity are the diversity of California students and students with disabilities. 
I wonder how you might amplify what is it that we really mean by the diversity of California students? Because before you spoke, Commissioner Gross, I was going to say I wanted you to remark on the absence of cultural relevancy in this document. And I think it's connected to what you said. Oftentimes, when we clump all students into access and equity, and we don't call particular students out as we discuss access and equity, they become invisible. And so I would like to see more in this resource guide. I would like to see cultural relevancy and cultural sustainability called out specifically in these documents that we create from the commission um, when we talk about the diversity of California students. I think that we can do better um, in that regard. And the other um, comment I wanted to make is really a curiosity. Um, and maybe this isn't the right time, Commissioner Martinez, on this agenda item, but I'm curious about the connection between the RICA, the new literacy TPA, and the ED TPA. I, I missed the last commission meeting. I apologize to my colleague. Maybe it was taken up then. But does this TPA take the place of RICA? Does it take the place of the multiple subject TPA? So is the multiple subject TPA going to be in mathematics? I'm just confused. I want to be clear about how these pieces fit, fit together. So it is intended by the Senate Bill 488 to replace the RICA. But uh, it's going to replace the RICA by becoming a performance assessment within the TPA structure that we have. So we are, as we're getting the, the standard for literacy and the teaching performance expectations for literacy designed and developed now for August presentation to you. Alongside that, we'll be appointing a design team for the, the new TPA for literacy, which we're going to call a literacy performance assessment at the moment, the LPA, if you will, as a replacement for RICA. And a serious consideration is what happens to the structure of the Cal TPA? Uh, is this a new third cycle? Does it replace one of the other two cycles? What are the ways in which the architecture of TPA as we've known it with RICA TPA or new LPA, how is that gonna to come together is still an open question. We are, um, there's, and, and in, in point of fact, we, we probably need the TPE portion of this work to emerge in order to begin to, to really think about what is the best structure for a performance set of, of uh, tasks to, to gauge a candidate's readiness to teach reading based on, based on a performance assessment. So that information is really to be developed when we pull the next design team together that's focused on the performance assessment. Whatever is designed as the state model for this, uh, ED TPA is a separate TPA and the FAST uh, performance assessment by, at Fresno, each of them will, will have to figure out how, that, how this TPA is accommodated in their infrastructure as well. So this work, will begin and, and then roll through all forms of TPA that are approved for use in California as we head toward 2025 when it has to be implemented. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. thank you for that clarification. This is gonna be a complex process. And yes. I, you know, I want us to pay attention to not only the additional, this is all important stuff, and the TPEs, I think, are critical to guide institutions of teacher preparation, and I appreciate them. And I'm also mindful of what is the additional labor for our candidates and also for our teacher preparation program and the faculty that are going to be responsible for, you know, redesign and implementation. So I just I wanted to see how those pieces are going to fit together. Thank you. Sure. Do you have a response? Actually, I have a question to, to build on that. I didn't realize I didn't know the answer to this, but the development of the literacy TPA, the LPA, is, um, is, is it under the same sort of statute of performance assessment that allows um, other organizations and institutions to develop their own performance assessment and have it approved by the commission? Can they develop a literacy performance assessment and have it approved by the commission, or is it a different... Well, the, the new statute that was adopted as part of Senate Bill 488 
references the originating statute, uh, 44320.2, if you're interested, is the originating statute for TPA, and 44320.3 is the new statute for the LPA. And the new statute references the old statute, and the old statute enables programs to design their own assessments, but they have to meet the commission's assessment quality standards for validity and reliability. In the history of our TPA, uh, there have been two efforts, three, well, two efforts really to do that, to create a model where institutions develop the model and that met the standards of validity and reliability and were approved. The first was the PACT, which was the performance assessment for California teachers. CTC developed our original Cal TPA and the University of California, Stanford University, a number of institutions got together and said, well, the legislature is allowing us to come up with our own design, let's do that. And they did. And the, the pact uh, was operational for many years uh, before it, it moved to the next phase, which was to become the ED TPA, which has now become a national performance assessment that, that had its roots here. So that was one effort uh, undertaken in response to the, the right that the legislature gave to design uh, for programs to design their own. The second effort is the Fresno uh, performance assessment. I cannot remember what AST stands for. FAST is the name of it. Can't draw the name, uh, the name, those, uh, the acronym out yet. But FAST was designed by Cal State Fresno to also um, meet the commission standards of uh, pro for assessment design related to validity and reliability. Uh, the commission several years ago conducted, we had uh, funding and awarded a contract to Humro, uh, which was a, a company to come in and do an analysis of all three approved TPAs for, against our standards for validity, reliability, uh, and implementation, and to determine are they comparable and they actually did find that they are comparable in terms of meeting a standard of validity and reliability, et cetera. So the process that the commission has put in place previously for approving alternative assessments is very rigorous. Um, as a result, we don't have you know, hundreds of TPAs out there uh, that, that you know, are, have all been approved. I think it takes some effort to mount and put together a performance assessment that meets this high standard. Uh, but that is allowed in statute, um, and um, it, the new statute references the old statute. Is that, that was a long answer to a short question. I, it was helpful. May a ask great a follow answer, up question. important one. Thanks. Yeah, and then Commissioner Grenershire wants to get in too. Which one? I'll let you guys. We are out of practice here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there conversation about the LTPA being locally scored? I, where do we talk about whether these are centrally or locally scored? Because one of the challenges we have with the TPA is then how do you use the results of the TPA to, um, to adjust to counsel students to, for educative purposes other than just passing or not passing. And I'm, so I'm wondering if you all have talked about this TPA being locally scored. We have not had that conversation yet. This TPA is still uh, very much on the drawing board and no architecture has been put together for it. But I will say this, the assessment design standards that have been adopted by this body include provisions for local scoring. Um, but no institution that I'm aware of has, and I'm looking to Amy, no institution, Amy Rising is, has been our director and developer of performance assessments. Uh, no institution has taken advantage of the local scoring option, which also needs to include rigor because this validity is essential for a performance assessment, but so is reliability. And the reliability comes in when you start to talk about the scoring of it and making sure you have inter-rater reliability and all of those things. So uh, that option is available within the assessment design standards, but has not been taken up by institutions to date. So I had the a similar question to my colleague across the aisle there. And, and I'm hearing in my segment some confusion about whether this is a new TPA. And, and even today, I'm hearing the learning performance assessment. So I think we want to be really clear mm -hmm. 
that this is an LPA of the reading assessment, uh, but it's within the big TPA bucket. Is that what I'm hearing? At and the, the big TPA bucket's gonna be revised. Well, at the moment, what is required by Senate Bill 488 is that we design a performance assessment that will take the place of RECA. That's what the legislation calls for us to do. And that's what our design team will do. I think one of the questions that I'm hearing uh, here at the table is, are we going to add a third cycle to a two cycle Cal TPA? And, and that feels like overload. Yeah. And that's what we're hearing from the field as well. But that, that question has been asked many times, but we do not have an answer yet. There, are, there will be options. And we're gonna talk some more about TPA tomorrow to, to go a little deeper. Uh, but, but there are some options to take a look at the Cal TPA, which is the state model that we've adopted, and consider whether one of these cycles could be overhauled to become the literacy performance assessment and just blend that into the Cal TPA. Uh, and, and focus, I mean, one of the performance assessment tasks, task one or cycle one or cycle two, must already address literacy. Uh, the other one must address math for the multiple subject and for the special education model. Yeah, I'm looking to Amy over there. She's my, she's my, yeah, you've got it right uh, person. Thank you. Um, because I think, I think the concern you're raising is one that we've heard all over the field. I think there are many people who are very excited to move RECA from a standardized multiple choice test with short constructed responses into an authentic performance assessment. There are many programmatic improvements that will occur if you do that. That's what we've learned from TPA. And that's, I think, why the legislature set forth to do that. Um, but it, it is possible to have too much performance assessment. It is possible. You don't often hear that from me, but- but Julie noted at 2.54 <laughs> right? on Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> I'm, I'm on camera and this, this is input, you know, can't ever unring that bell, can I? Uh, so, so I think this is going to be a serious consideration when we pull our design team together uh, to consider how can we best construct this so that we're not overwhelming a population of teacher candidates uh, and crushing them under the weight of this. Um, so, so I think there's some real opportunities to think about how we're going to do it. Uh, and it will take some time. It usually takes two years of hard pressing work, often three years, to get a performance assessment designed piloted, field tested, run a year, see how people perform, perform, set a score. I mean, that's an that's a intensive endeavor of steps that need to be taken. Um, and, and so the beginning work is to conceptualize where does it fit in the array of performance assessment? Uh, and we, we don't have an answer to recommend to you at this stage um, because all of our work on 488 right now is focused on the work that Nancy and Roxanne have presented, which is to let's get the material identified first, and then let's uh, and then we draw from the material to construct the assessment. And we will be with you uh, regularly to provide updates and to do you know reality checking with you, and uh, and to develop this over the next two years, probably beginning this fall. Uh, we have a 2025 deadline by which this needs to be ready to be operational. We know that's possible <laughs> because Amy and her team of, uh, her, of wonderful consultants ha have proven to us that we can do this in this kind of time frame. Um, so, so that is an exciting piece of work. Um, yeah, Commissioner Chair Slan. I'm just going to say that um, I would like to commend those of you who have been working on this and uh, the commission in general for developing a guidance resource for programs to begin working on and changing while um, we're building other things as well. This, this is so critical to help us get to that place that we need to get to. And uh, if we didn't, I noticed in the item you had, you know, your two milestones that you put together to say, this is the most efficient way to do this. And you were working on this guide a long time ago. So programs now are starting to develop their pathways and their courses and their experiences to help our educators become better instructors in literacy. So uh, well done, I think. Other questions or comments by commissioners about the process or the report? 
Okay. Um, not seeing any, and nobody arm wrestling over who gets to go next. Um, we'll go ahead and move to a vote. Um, this is an action item. Do I have a motion that the commission approve the report to the legislature on Senate Bill 488 teacher credentialing reading instruction for transmittal to the legislature? And I do wonder, actually, do I need to amend that to say to include the recommendations of the commission? Because Commissioner Gross made a recommendation about them, including the date May into the timeline. I did. OK. Uh, okay. And simply update the report with okay. that. So we will do that. Thank you. Okay. So we'll vote to approve the report and that um, we know the staff will take the direction of the commissioners who provided some feedback to the report itself. Okay. Do I have a motion? Okay. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Chair. Do I have a second? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Gross. Okay. Um, we will now move to a vote. Any further discussion before that? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Perdue and Ms. Burleson. Uh, Commissioner Chair Sloan um, did a great job of commending you for your work, and, and thank you. This is really quite complex, so thank you. When I do the vote, I still keep on thinking we're on Zoom and that I have to hear everybody's voice, right? <laughs> so this whole collective I or nay is um, a little shocking at times. Still used to our one-by-one -one vote. 